Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. We now have Danielle Deibler from Ignited Artists, a very exciting studio. It got started uh, last year, 2014, right? Um, so she's here to talk about something very important, which is raising funding. Now, Ignited Artists raised some money from Sega Networks earlier this year. And, you know, there's any number of different ways you can go about this. But the thing is, you can have a good idea for a game, but actually getting the money to make that a reality, that's a, that's a very specific set of skills. It's a very specific set of uh, strategies. So if you'd like to put your hands together, welcome Danielle to the stage. You can tell us more about that. Thank you very much. So I am going to talk actually about kind of all the different ways we tried to raise money uh, before we finally closed money, which was, you know, obviously a great day. Uh, but I, I figured it was probably a good thing to share. Uh, there are definitely a lot of different ways to raise money out there. Uh, I'll give you a little intro to myself. Uh, I run Ignited Artists, uh, I'm a CEO and co-founder there. Uh, we're a San Francisco-based mobile game studio. I feel a little weird after the last talk where it's like, don't do mobile. Um, but we definitely very much wanted to go after the mobile space. Um, I've been in internet tech for about 20 years. I started actually in telecom and uh, interactive communications. I've worked at Adobe, Kixi, and I was at EIR at Trinity. So I got a chance to kind of sit on the other side of the table for VC funding and kind of see what the partners talk about when the people who pitch them leave. Uh, and I think that gave me a great perspective when I decided to start my own thing and then get out there and start raising money. Um, I have two fabulous uh, co-founders who are my partners in crime. Uh, and I think I call us the Holy Trinity because we have a kind of CTO leadership technology person. Uh, we have Alessandro Tento, who is the uh, awesome Italian looking pirate with the fire on his shoulder. Um, <laughs> he came from uh, Activision, has won uh, an Oscar for Shrek. So really, really creative, uh, rich history in terms of video gaming and also movies. Um, and uh, Scott Foe, who is actually in the audience and will be emceeing tomorrow. Uh, he's a mobile gaming hall of fame inductee, uh, has about 10 plus years of mobile free-to-play experience, which I think is probably like being in the stone ages of mobile. It's kind of all of the mobile experience that you could possibly have in terms of kind of getting games out there and into the market. Uh, and I look at it like it's, uh, you know, a cleric, a warrior and a DPSer, right? You kind of have all the things that you need to try to bring a team together and raise the money and get the next thing going. So before we really did the like the go out and start, we, we did we had a couple of like harder conversations and I would recommend anybody starting a company do this. Uh, we talked about runway a lot in terms of you know the brutal truth of how long can you go without a paycheck? Um, and how long can you, how long can everybody that's in your team go without a paycheck? Um, and what does that mean? Like, what are you going to do when one person really needs to take a job or you need to at least take some contract work to kind of get to the next day? Um, and we had that discussion and really talked about what we were going to do and how long we were going to put into the process. Um, and then we also decided roles, responsibilities, and kind of the division of shares in the company. Um, I coach a lot of entrepreneurs who are like doing their first time business. And I'd say that probably the one thing that I see that's a mistake consistently is they don't decide how they're going to disperse equity in the company until they've already started to build the product and raise money. And then everybody fights about it because now there's money involved. So it's just way easier to be like, this is what we're doing, get it on paper, uh, do the paperwork, actually get it done, file and become a corporation, You know, talk to an attorney, pay a little bit of money, get your stock paperwork done. Uh, it also feels really awesome and kind of real when you get the incorporation paperwork and you get like all these official documents that have your name on them and little things like getting business cards, it makes you feel like it's a real job and it is a real job. It's just, it's your job and the work is coming from you. Uh, and then I think the other thing that we did really well was we talked on Skype every day. So Alessandra was in Southern California, Scott and I are both local to San Francisco. Uh, we talked every day on Skype. It was literally like our daily stand-up kind of a thing. What are we going to get done today? What are we going to do tomorrow? What have we already finished? So getting in 
into a rhythm with each other is very, very important from the beginning. Uh, and then you need to also make sure it's time to network in the industry. Don't like hide in a cave um, and you know kind of do your thing and not get out there and meet people and talk to them because those people are hopefully the people that are going to actually help to fund you or give you great ideas uh, and fuel your creativity. So you want to make sure you stay connected to the, the industry that you're, you're trying to become a part of. So in terms of how you can raise money, I basically divided it into six major ways. We clearly went the strategic route, but we went lots of other routes first. Um, so in terms of bootstrapping, I, I think every company does this. It's typically like you either have a founder who puts a little bit of money in and gets you started in the very beginning. We did do this. Um, and you, or you go out and you look for work for hire. And we thought a lot about this. Uh, ultimately, the pros did not outweigh the cons for us. Uh, the, the pros being you keep most of the company and maybe you get a little bit of cash and there's this awesome thing about having no money and having lots of constraints that makes you super focused and makes you make decisions really fast and that's awesome. Um, but you also have this real risk of it takes you off your mission and you start working on something else and you get completely bogged down with working on that and you never really get back to the thing that you really wanted to build when you started. Um, and I think that same budgetary uh, kind of constraint that's an awesome thing can also be very poor for doing long-term strategic planning. So if you're going to do this route, be really, 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 really realistic about your budget and keep whatever you're trying to build very, very simple so that you kind of hit your, you can hit the next set of milestones that you have and you can stay focused. So Angel is the next route. Uh, this is basically a bunch of high net worth individuals. It might be friends and family. Uh, that could be if you're super lucky, uh, depending on how well you get along with your family. These could be the people that you could leverage to fund you. Um, the other, pro, a big pro here is it really leaves the majority again of the, the shares of the company and the majority control of the company in the hands of the founders. And you also will yield a very strong network usually from fundraising this way. Uh, angel investors are typically operators or people that have come from your industry. And so that will give you a network of people who are also networked in your industry and they understand what you're doing. Uh, and they can typically give you good intros and advice and all kinds of support uh, from a system perspective. I'd say the biggest con here is you are going to meet with a lot of people um, and a lot of people are going to say no and you're also going to get small amounts of money that are spread over multiple investors and you have to manage that uh, and it can be probably one of the more difficult processes to manage if you're not like a full-time money manager kind of a person. Uh, you also don't usually get enough in the game space to ship your product and market it. Um, and that is a huge con because you're going to be basically mid-cycle when you're going out to fundraise again. Uh, and you've got to be thinking about that, like how far can this money get me? So the one, the biggest tip here, the people we had the most success with, even in terms of just having conversations, were investors who had made successful games investments before. So check people out before you go and talk to them. It's not enough to know what their net worth is. Understand the types of things they like to invest in. If you can find out what kinds of games they like, uh, typically on this side, a big thing is if they like first person shooters, they will give you 25K to build a first person shooter that's awesome, like one that they want. But if they don't, you might not get anything because that's just not the genre. It's very personal for angels a lot of times, especially when it's around entertainment or games. So VC and seed, I kind of, I lumped together. Uh, and I also have some stats from a really cool presentation that uh, DocSend did with uh, Harvard Business Review that was, it came out like at the same time I was building this presentation, but it literally coincided, like in terms of the stats, they were almost like number for number in terms of the meetings and all of the kind of data they had. So I was like, I have to include some of these. Um, so venture or, or seed capital is basically about the, the time that someone is willing to invest. Seed is you're just getting your team together. You're probably coming up with your concept and your pitch. You have an idea. You probably have a demo, but it's really prototypey and it, it isn't really ready for a lot of people to see it other than to get some vision off of it. Um, at series A, you're going to be a lot farther along as a company. Um, you, you may have a product that is in market and you're looking for something to grow or expand. Uh, this is almost always going to be a priced round, which means that you are going to set a value. Actually, the VC is going to set a value on your company, and then they are going to give you cash for some percentage of your company. So they're going to take some percentage of ownership, and that's also going to give them some day-to-day -day, um, you know, say in what you do through their relationship with you on the board of directors. 
So when you talk to a VC fund, always do your homework. Um, when we met with a fund, we almost always met with at least one other person that had raised money through them so that we could understand where are they comfortable from a timing perspective. They may have like tons of things on their website that talk about, oh, early stage companies and we like to be there as early as possible, but they may really invest when you're a little bit farther along or their version of early stage might be a lot different than your version of early stage. So try to make sure that you talk to a couple of people they've invested in. It'll also help you understand what they're looking for. Um, have a demo and a deck. I think you'd have this throughout the entire thing. The thing that's really different with VC is they're looking for some disruption or some upside. Why are you going to be the best of the people who are trying to go after this space? What genre or what thing are you going to create with what you're building? And you want to think long and hard about that and have a good intelligent answer when they ask you that question. Uh, Sequoia Capital has this fantastic template. Take it off the internet and fill it in. Do not be like, I need to innovate with my deck and it needs to be the most beautiful thing in the entire world and I need to spend seven hours in Photoshop on it. They have a set of, of kind of pattern recognition type of things and one of them is they expect you to have certain slides and especially if you're sending the deck ahead, you want to be able to at least check the box so you can get to the next level if you're really interested in, in this VC being the one that invests in you. Uh, also keep up to date on the industry. I do not know how many 8 a.m. meetings I have been in where I've been asked a question that literally came out on TechCrunch or you know over Twitter like 20 minutes ago, and or even during the meeting sometimes, uh, depending on how kind of focused on their mobile phone they are. And you want to have an intelligent answer, and you want to be able to to, to stay up to up to date on what what's going on in the industry. I say the the next set of kind of quick things. So make sure your deck looks great on mobile. Most of the time, these people are going to open up an email from you and they're gonna look at it on their mobile device. So look at what your presentation looks like on mobile before you send it out to people. Uh, once you get a meeting, always bring your founding team with you. Uh, this, being on the VC side as well, is something that I, it was commented on. If only the CEO shows up, they, they wonder where the rest of your team is. Um, and many VC invest because of the team first and your product or strategy second. So you really want everybody there. Um, and then I would say we did not get funded by any of these people and I still put them in my slide. Um, they are all really, really great about telling you why they didn't fund you and it, whether it's market timing or what about your pitch was kind of not right for them or didn't resonate. Uh, and many of them are also people who have stayed in touch and kind of given great industry insight to me personally and to other people in the team. So Upfront in LA, Initial Capital in the UK, Signia Ventures and Mayfield that are in the Bay Area were all really great people to pitch. And they were great enough that even though they didn't give us money, I felt like it was a, it was a really worthwhile, good connection. Um, also, is your team debrief after every meeting? You know, I know this sounds kind of like pedantic, but note the key action items and then iterate on your presentation or what you're talking about. A lot of times you'll get out of a meeting, you'll be like, oh, we didn't get it. You know, you talk for two minutes, but you don't really internalize that and take action on it. You have to, it has, it's, it's a job. Raising money is part of a job. Um, also, the knowing your numbers piece is, it, I think it's kind of a twofold thing. It's know your industry numbers. If you're going after mobile, know the top 10 grossing, know the top 10 on each platform, know the differences, uh, know how much money it's going to take to build your game. Uh, it's also about knowing what you think your company is worth. So the very first time you think about valuation should not be when a VC asks you what you're looking to price the round at. Um, you should have thought about it, talked to a few other companies, done a little bit of homework so that you have a, a truly intelligent answer on this. Um, because it also is a, it's kind of like gambling in Vegas. Like you go to the table, you win a hundred dollars. If you, if that's your kind of like your upper limit, you should walk away and be like, I hit my upper limit. This is awesome. Um, if you are down too much, you also kind of walk away from the table and you, you want to, do the same thing here. Set an upper and a lower bound for yourself so that you really understand um, what it is that you expect to get out of the deal and how long you expect your funding to last. Uh, also, building an alliance with an attorney. Uh, we have a great attorney at Fenwick and West who I like totally love. His name is Bill Schreiber. Highly recommend him. Um, but find yourself someone who can give you legal advice because if you're dealing with a VC firm, they have a lawyer. Um, they have many lawyers and they have many other people outside of, the, of their company that they can also leverage. You definitely need someone who is an advocate on your side that can help you 
you. Term sheets are very, very confusing. Um, and there'll be tons of documents during a closing that you probably will never see unless you've closed a round of money before. Uh, and it's good, it's important to understand what you're signing. Uh, so look for someone that you can trust that can hopefully can help you with like deferring or something until after your closing so that you're not putting yourself out of pocket for that money as well. In the Bay Area, that's actually a very common arrangement. So this is kind of, this is from the uh, HBR doc sent stuff. So they talked basically about the app market. Um, so I would say that this is very true in terms of the seed round. So 58 investors you contact, 40 meetings, that feels pretty good for games. Uh, capital raised, I'd cut that number in half if you're a game company versus an app company. Um, and weeks to close, I would double that. It takes a little bit longer. Usually you want to show some progress during the closing period. They want to see you making progress uh, and see how you work together. So it is, games are definitely, I do not believe, as easy to raise money for as apps or enterprise software is. Um, and I've experienced raising money for apps and enterprise software both in addition to games, and games felt 20 times harder. Um, and much harder for the person I was pitching to grok in a lot of cases. Uh, the page, the length and the average minutes, the minutes on this one, the thing I think is interesting is this is the number of minutes that once they open the presentation that they actually read and look at it. And the majority of these, that 3.44 minutes is observed on a mobile device. So in another kind of stat they show, it's that 80% of these presentations are viewed for the very first time by a VC that you sent them to on mobile. Uh, so that mobile thing is, is really, is pretty huge. Um, so in terms of where you raise money from, typically an angel is gonna be somewhere from 25 to $100,000. Seed firms, like people who specialize, like initial capital in doing first round funding, are about 10X that. Um, it might be a little harder to get that money, but you also don't end up with 10 investors or 20 investors that you have to manage, you end up with one. Uh, so I definitely advise if you are going the seed route that you go after angels and networks of angels, uh, as well as firms that specialize in seed funding. If you're going after it for games though, make sure that they've made at least one game investment or they've made some kind of public announcement that says that games is something they want to go after. Uh, and then on series A versus seed funding, uh, I kind of applied my same little formula. So they say 9.6 weeks for an average seed uh, close. I think if you're closing a series A for a game company, you need to multiply by four. <laughs> So you are going to be a much longer period of time to close that money. Uh, and you're not gonna raise probably $8 million. You're probably gonna raise closer to four. Uh, and that's pretty consistent if you look at Series A raises across the gaming space. This isn't just us or one or two CEOs I've talked to, but it's probably 10 or 15 of the money that's been raised over the last five years or so. Uh, it takes a, it is a, it's not a totally dire picture, but it does take a, a long time. Uh, and you've really gotta find the right investors. So strategic is what we closed. Almost always it's gonna be a game publisher or someone in the consumer space. Um, I think the two things that you definitely need to go into a publisher with is an original idea, something that is your IP that you think is exciting, that you are passionate and excited about, and then something that is their IP and an idea of what you might do with it. You don't need to have a fully functional game or a prototype, but you need to be thinking about it from both perspectives in terms of what the first title that you are gonna do as a studio is. Um, and you also want to look at what publishers have done in the past. So if they've never made an investment ever, and they've never done the type of thing that you're asking them to do, they might not be the right strategic partner. If they've made acquisitions in the past, and they've invested in small indie game, uh, game studios, or they've published a lot of third-party games, they may be open to what you want to do. Um, the thing that we, that we did with Sega was we had gone in and asked and, and talked to them about a work for hire deal and then said, well, we don't really want to treat it like traditional work for hire. We want a strategic investment. And I think some of it was timing and the team, uh, the fact that Scott had actually worked with them before, uh, 10 years prior in his career, I think was definitely in our favor. But they were looking to make a move into mobile um, and they wanted to announce multiple deals at a, at a similar time, and they did in February, uh, a studio that they, two studios they, they made investments in and another one that they acquired. Um, and so we kind of had right place, right time, but we never would have gotten it if we hadn't asked. If we hadn't gone back and said, this is really what we want. We want to build our own studio. We don't want to just build a game for a publisher. 
Um, and then I think the other thing that is important is understanding what your team brings to the deal and what the publisher brings to the deal. Money is great. Um, I think we all love money, yay money, um, but you definitely need to understand that the money that you're getting is the right money and is smart money. Um, and for us, it was we understood the Western market really well, um, and Sega understands the Eastern market really well, and if you kind of bring that together, you have Wonder Twins Activate, and you now have a good global launch partner, someone who understands how to take something across the entire globe um, and, and has a good understanding of how a game might need to be adjusted to be a global global launch. Uh, and that was really a, a huge contributing factor for us. Uh, also the fact that the, the strategic direction was in the same direction that we wanted to go in. So the last one is crowdfunding. We did not do this, and I can tell you why we did not do it. Um, ultimately, we felt like it was a great pre-sales platform, um, but that it did not feel like the best way to fund a game or a studio, uh, especially a studio versus getting funding for one title that you're going to produce. Uh, it is great market validation, um, at, but depending on how much you get, you may not have enough to actually fully complete the game that you've committed to. Uh, it also requires a lot of work. We talked to three or four people who had run, uh, indie, or had run Kickstarter campaigns and then did a ton of research. Um, most people have 30% of the investment in the campaign lined up on the very first day. So they go out, they, they you get their friends and family and all of the supporters and they come in and they contribute that much and then everybody feels like they're kind of backing a winner already and it just kind of rolls forward and you, you, you hit your goal. And that's great, but it's a lot of work to get that and it's almost as much work to get that as it might be for you to raise money that doesn't have the same level attached to it. Um, and some of the budgets were somewhere between seventy-five dollars and $125,000 to just get the campaign out there and running. Then you have to update it. You have to update it on a frequent basis if you want people to really back it. Um, and so, and some of those things that you're going to create for Kickstarter, they're things that you wouldn't create for six months or 10 months or a year in a regular development cycle when you're building a title. You might not have key art until just a little bit before you ship, but you have to have something like that that's really beautiful and ready for a Kickstarter campaign. So it just it changes the way that you're going to build as well. Um, I do, on the other hand, think it is a fantastic way for you to validate that the title is going to be popular and popular with your demographic. So I want to thank the Harvard Business Review guys and Docsend for publishing stuff that actually supported uh, the, the data that I was collecting, especially right in the period that I was prepping for my presentation. Um, I don't know how they knew, but it was awesome. And uh, I want to thank you and also my co-founders. Uh, and I am ready for questions if anybody has any. Yeah, so we've definitely got time for, for one or two. Does anybody have one? Uh, yeah, I, I shared them, and uh, it, they should be available through the conference. I don't know where the, the, what the URL is, but I did check the little box that said they could publish my slides. <laughs> ask us about it. Uh, anyone else? Uh, right up the back there. Hold on. So are you publishing with Sega Networks as well? Yes, we are going to publish our first title with Sega as well. So how, from a negotiation point of view, did you keep publishing and investment in one deal, or did you, do you we separate We completely them? separated it. And you, I you would advise that if you are getting strategic investment from a publisher, I can't tell you every publisher that's out there, but fundamentally they, they're different to me, so I separated them. I wanted the investment closed and then the publishing deal to be something that was completely 100% separate, and I feel like it's a much better way from a negotiating perspective to work with the investor. And was that the way the deal was set up to start with, or did you have to force them apart? Um, I don't want to, like, force sounds like it was like a huge negotiation. We asked for that, and, and they were like, okay, that's fine. So, I, but it was, yes, the mindset, and I think you're going to find this with a lot of publishers, is if they, they want to tie the two deals together, because that's how they really understand them internally, and it's probably a lot how they're pitching them internally as well. But we didn't have any issue be, when we asked to separate them. Uh, time for one more, if anyone has one. Hmm? Well, I might have one. I mean, okay. you talked about um, the strategic investment from Sega, and it was kind of like you were in the meeting for something else, and you kind of chanced your arm, you, you locked it up, right? What, how do you think it would have gone, had that not worked out, do you think you would have ended up 
do it going the, 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 the VC route or the angel route? I mean, or, or is that ju just what you wanted from the start? I think we probably would have ended up going strategic at the timing that we, we raised money in the market um, pretty much no matter what. I like, I, I'm not saying that we didn't have other options, but the most attractive ones were, especially like taking the previous presentation actually into account with essential, with the cost of acquisition on mobile right now and how hard it is to actually deal with discovery. Publishers do add some value there. Um, and they keep you from hiring a bunch of people in the, right in the very beginning when you're also trying to get your first title out and you're trying to get everybody to gel and work together. Um, and so I, I do feel like that headache, especially on your first title, is something that a publisher really helps with. If you have a good, a good kind of equitable relationship where both of you have agency, right? Okay, well, if you'd all put your hands together for Danielle.